thought, you know, Arizona, it's the summer. It's just gonna keep sliding down there. I can grab a, oh, hey, look at that, magic. No, sorry, we don't believe in magic. Uh, Holy Spirit. <laughs> There we go. Amen. Amen. No magic in here. Just the Holy Spirit this morning. Uh, I want to say a special thank you just to everybody who helped make this uh, moment possible, especially to, I know, Bambi and Dan, uh, you guys were in the back helping out, and I really appreciate you guys for making that moment special for our students. Uh, Dan kept us, you know, primed with some good conversation back there. And uh, just thank you so much, uh, Pastor Dave, and just church family for helping make this uh, an opportunity. Well, this church an opportunity to save space for our kids, our students, sorry, not kids, students, young adults, future um, of, uh, you know, of, our, of this generation to be a part of this community experience spiritually. So you guys are amazing. And congratulations to our, uh, to our students who were just baptized. Uh, good for you guys for making that decision this morning. So I just want to leave you with a little, bit ch- a little challenge before we head out. I told some of our students who were getting baptized, I told them that baptism is pretty similar to marriage in that the ceremony isn't what solely bonds you to Christ for life. It's simply an external expression of an internal spiritual God impression. What God has already done inside of you, this ceremony, is just the external representation of the work that God has already begun in you. Amen? And so this, this, this rings true for all of us because commitment is huge. Commitment is a very scary thing. I should know. Um, you know, all my life, Jaden was kind of saying, all my life I've moved from place to place to place. I've moved from family to family to family, parent to parent to parent. And so it, it's been hard, you know, sometimes to understand the, the value uh, that comes with commitment. It's almost like if things don't go perfect, maybe it's time to leave. But it's the opposite with Jesus. When things aren't going perfect, that's the moment we need to cleave. Uh, we need to hang on to Christ, and we need to continue to pursue Him and go after Him. So this morning, you know, baptism, that commitment with Jesus, is, it's a huge decision. But I'm, I'm confident of the verse, you know, that George shared in his prayer, Philippians 1.6, where, where Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So God is at work in heaven for you and me right now. I always tell my students, he's not sitting back, kicking back, and relaxing, right? Not doing anything. The Bible says he is our high priest. He lives to intercede for you and me. He is working right now, amen? He's working overtime. He is the king of kings. He doesn't exist so that way we can arbitrarily serve him. He exists because he also wants to serve us. It's what he lived for. It's what he lives for, and that's why he came down here to, to die for you and me. So Bianca, Jada, Melise, uh, Nizemana, to the rest of us, God has promised to complete and perform that work within you and within me. Our only responsibility is to stay and get out of the way. Amen? When God wants to do what he wants to do in our lives, we have to let him begin to work in our lives. The fear of commitment can be scary to anything, as I kind of led with. Um, but the whole point of Christian Christianity is, a big part of it is this whole commitment thing, being committed to somebody despite everything. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that yes, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus are going to experience what? Persecution. Thank you. Persecution. All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will experience persecution or some form of hardship. As we were having Sabbath school this morning, I was kind of sharing uh, with, you know, with those who were with us, some of the high schoolers, that it's almost like when we follow Jesus or we make this commitment to him, oftentimes we think, man, we're invincible. We're like Superman. Like, we can come out and like, world, what are you going to do to me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Amen? Uh, it's almost like we feel like we're invincible. We're on cloud nine. I tell you what, when I first gave my life to Christ, I was walking up into this church and I was like, what are you guys doing? You don't really love Jesus. Um, I, I felt like I was completely sold into it until hardship and persecution came in a variety of ways. It can be spiritually. It can be academically. Amen? Um, it can be in a variety of different ways. But the Bible says those who desire to live godly lives will experience some hardship. So it's scary sometimes when we do make these big commitments because we are fearful and we are knowledgeable of that there's going to be trials and temptations and things that are going to come our way. It's naturally going to happen. Now, 
the devil works in a variety of different ways to tempt us and distract us. But I think the promise this morning, it's in Isaiah 54, verse, verse 17. I just quoted this verse. It says, the promise of scripture is that no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what he tries to do with us, the Bible says Nor, no weapon that's been formed against us will prosper. And to those of you who were just baptized, the Bible says, let no one look down on your youth, but instead be an example to all believers in conduct and speech and in your way of living. But I also want to add this for those of us who are in Christ Jesus and for those of us who even might be struggling with our commitment to him. This applies to everybody. The verse continues, every tongue which chooses to rise against you in judgment of you, you shall condemn. Because here's the thing, we so identify ourselves with our Heavenly Father that anyone who tries to step against us, the Bible says God is the one who is for us. He's there to protect us. I don't know if I've shared this story before, but I remember uh, I had a little rendezvous one time during my high school years, and uh, I got in trouble. I snuck out of the house with my big brother, and my big brother and I came home, and it was a whole fiasco. We just kind of snuck out to hang out with some friends. We weren't doing anything bad right and so we were kind of all hanging out and Nicole of course we're like mom what are you doing like she called the cops on us and we're like mom what are you doing and she was like well I was scared for you guys because as parents I I assume that you didn't make this commitment that you know you have you make this commitment to keep your child alive it's like a huge commitment um I I worked at summer camp for a couple summers and I remember I got 12 little kids and that child proofed me for the rest of my life I was like, I remember I lost one kid once. It, guys, it was 5 in the morning. 5 in the morning. Or no, like 4.30. And the, and the assistant director, Mark Tamalea, pulls up in his golf cart. And he's like, hey, Zach, is this kid yours? And here comes one of my little campers. Oh, hey. Just kind of waddling on through. This is adventure camp. Kid couldn't have been like older than 6 or 7. He just left. And, of course, he makes me even look worse. When, uh, you know, Pastor Mark a- asks him, like, hey, wh- why, did you, why did you leave the cabin? He's like, oh, I just needed someone to help me, someone to show me where the bathroom was. And he's like, bro, where were you? You can't show this kid where the bathroom is? Not, oh, my bad. Um, you know, and it, so it's a huge commitment. I remember one time I even, um, I lost a kid. I, I swear, uh, I'm the worst. Uh, I lost the kid. We were going through an activity. wasn't completely my fault. You know, we were part of this activity. Um, I don't even know what we were doing. Geocaching. We were just out in the hot Arizona desert up at Camp Yawa Pines. And, of course, some activity staff, oh, activity staff, some activity staff decided to come out and attack, proceed to attack my five- and six-year-olds with, like, water guns. And they're like, we're going to get you. And so our kids are just, my kids just like sprawl. Like after Jesus was taken into captivity, the disciples just kind of scatter. All my kids, six and seven years, gone. And I'm like, I'm going to get fired. Like, I can't do this. Like, I suck. Like, and I remember being so disheartened. I went to, uh, I went to, I went to, uh, I went to uh, Hannah, uh, and, which was the girls director, Hannah Burks. And I remember went to her and I was like in tears. Hannah, I can't do this. I just can't. I'm not kind of, I'm never going to be a parent. I'm never, I was like, and you know, she, she consoled me. And she's like, stop crying. You got this. Suck it up. Uh, that type of love. And I remember like, you, you're right. I got this. And then uh, like shortly after that, one kid proceeded to push the other kid off of a rock. So he hit his head against the rock. And then I quit. No, I'm just joking. I stayed. But it's huge. And here's the thing. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. But Who better to trust the next generation with than Jesus? What did he say to the Father? He said, all that you have given me, I have kept safely. I have protected them. And if we allow God, he will protect us and he will be there for us. The Bible says he is our strong tower. He is our refuge. He's an ever-present help in a time of trouble. So trouble's going to come. Persecution's going to come. Accidents will happen. Woo! But thank goodness for Jesus. The Bible says he is committed to us and he is for us. It doesn't matter what people say against us. When people try to condemn us or judge us. What does the Bible say? Just be an example. Show them that God is for us. And with the, I, I, the, the, the verse in Isaiah 54, verse 17 ends with this. It says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness is from me. So God's like, if anyone has a problem with you, they have a problem with me. He says, this is your heritage. And that word heritage means security. 
It means this is the promised blessing that I have given you. No one can take this away from you. Why? Because it's a righteousness that comes from me. So when someone tries to judge you for being unrighteous, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? He says, cling to me. Because of this heritage, I give to you this righteousness I've reserved for you, the Bible says. So ultimately, in Christ Jesus, we have this this amazing sense of security that no matter what, as long as we keep clinging to Jesus, as long as we keep running to Jesus constantly and consistently, we know that God will be there for you and for me. And so there should be no confusion this morning about what the purpose of our life is. If Jesus is this committed to you and me, he would love the same commitment from you and me. It is that opportunity to be able to give our imperfect commitment, the Bible says, over to him. The Bible says, he who tries to find his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to tell you right now, like, it's a constant process. I'm not sure anyone, I've never met anyone who's just for sure figured out their life. There's always something. There's always, you know, there could always be more understanding. But the Bible says it's okay. We don't have to have it figured out. Where are my seniors at, right? You don't have to, it's okay. You don't have to have it figured out. You know, uh, I, I still don't have it figured out. I don't know if that's good or bad, but the Bible says the one thing that we're supposed to have in Christ Jesus is just to keep, keep coming to him. It says, he who, Matthew 10, 39, he who finds his life will lose it, but he who loses my, his life for my sake will find it. It's better to be confused with Jesus than certain apart from him. It's better to be confused and struggling. Your worst day with God is always going to be better than your best day without God. Constantly run to him. At the cross, it didn't look like Jesus was winning, which is why the disciples scattered. They weren't certain of what this man was doing. It didn't look like he was winning. It looked like he was losing. Everyone was giving him the opportunity to prove himself. But what the Bible says, it's all about losing your life and not trying to find it. And the Bible says he's been given the name above all names. That at that name, every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess. So here's the thing. Here's some encouragement for the journey. Look, you know, I get tired. Um, You know, uh, I, I go back and forth, especially sometimes with... You know, with, with running, uh, when, I, when I work out, sometimes, you know, it just trying to, running sucks, but I love it sometimes. Dean Mark inspires me. I try to keep it going. But sometimes it just gets so exhausting, and spiritually, it can be the same way. There, there comes a moment where it feels like Christianity becomes drudgery. And I want to tell you right now, when Christianity becomes drudgery, a drudgery we need to do things differently. When Christianity becomes drudgery, we're, we need to change things. We need to do things differently. This is what Jesus says to you and me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. I will give you rest. That word rest. I don't know about you and me, but rest is amazing. That's why I'm thankful for the Sabbath day, that rest that we can take mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And this isn't just a rest from physical labor. This is the rest that you're actually needing. The rest that keeps you going, that gives you the second wind to keep on performing. This is that rest that you need. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, follow me, because I am gentle and I am lowly and I will give you that rest for your soul. So when, when, when the commitment gets wavering and times get tired, remember that when you go to Jesus, it should be a restful intimacy. It should be a restful commitment between you and him. That doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but it should be Restful. That doesn't mean, sorry, by that I mean it doesn't always feel, it's not always going to feel like it's amazing or you got it. But the Bible says you keep resting in him, you just keep repeatedly, uh, repeatedly coming to him. If you ever feel lost, scripture says in Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink and what should I wear? For all these things are what unbelievers worry about. Your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. Continually seek him first. And everything else should be added unto you. The sense, if I'm not saying it enough, is we just keep seeking him consistently. My challenge is in John 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch does not bear fruit, and fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he prunes so that, it may be, so that way it may bear more fruit. 
Here's the beautiful promise that we have in Jesus. He does the work in us. Our responsibility is to continue with him, to abide with him and let him work on us. So oftentimes we try to get in the way and we, we, we overstep our commitment or we're fearful of the commitment we just made because we feel like, hey, I'm not doing it perfectly, so maybe we give up. Or we think to ourselves, man, I could be doing so much better, so we give up. The Bible says you just need to keep remaining. You need to keep abiding. A struggling Christian is still a growing Christian. And so that's the secret. We just keep abiding and we keep remaining. The Bible says don't worry about that stuff that's in your life. What does the Bible say? As long as you keep seeking him, God will do his best work in performing surgery in those areas of our lives to keep us fruitful and to keep God working within you and me. That's the promise he gives you and me today. And what I love about this is that it says the father is the vine dresser. You know, sometimes I get caught in this comparison trap. I have this neighbor. And I have these neighbors, the Maradas, okay? And, you know, they're like, yeah, we have a nice garden. I'm like, y'all have a farm, okay? And I try to grow my lowly salsa garden. And... If you look at my backyard, it is a wasteland. The apocalypse has come upon. I'll, I'll grow it back, Jeff, I promise. Um, I'll make sure there's some grass there. But, I, I, you know, I don't have a green thumb. I, I tried growing tomatoes. And even, you know, uh, Mr. Murata came over and to look at my garden. He's kind of like, yeah, I don't know what you're doing wrong, man. Um, and I just, you know, I, I look at that and I worry. And I'm like, I'm not a good vine dresser. I'm not a good gardener. I cannot take care of this thing at all. But the promise that we have in Jesus is as long as we remain in him, the Bible says God is the vine dresser. He takes care of you and me. I'm thankful that that's not my responsibility, but I have a heavenly father that does love me and will constantly care for me. He will cut away those things in my life that don't need to be there. He will help me see those weeds and pull up those things in my life that are not good for you and me. That will make more room for better roots to be more fruitful in whatever it is we are doing. So sometimes we overcomplicate this commitment. We make it more than it needs to be when Jesus Christ just keeps it simple. It's just about you and me. Let's keep this thing going. Be fruitful. Remain in me. That word abide is so amazing. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you in that same passage. I've done this work in you, and as long as you keep abiding in my word, my word will keep cleansing you. And this cleansing is amazing because not only is it him forgiving us of sin... But it's this process by which he cleanses us of sin. So this doesn't mean that we walk around like, you know, we're Superman and we're, we're never tempted or anything. It just means when we're tempted, we have more of a desire for the better thing. It means when we're tempted, we have already tasted and seen of what the Lord can provide both you and me. And whatever that appetizer is that he's offering, it does not compare to the entree that is coming. Amen? Uh, for those of you who struggle waiting for the food at, you know, Cheesecake Factory, those appetizers are amazing. But the Bible says the entree, the entree is the blessing. So as long as we keep hungering and thirsting after what the Father is providing for you and me, woo, we'll be so filled. It's so amazing. And uh, he promises that for you and for me. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to worship you this morning. And I ask that you bless the commitments that, you, that, that you've brought forth and the commitments that were made for you, Lord. Um, it could be so challenging in this world with all these distractions and all these opinions and all these things just pulling after us. No wonder the Bible calls it Babylon, this place of confusion, this place of opinions, Lord. Now more than ever, Father, we need to just double down in our commitment to you to continue to seek you, Father. And when the journey gets exhausting, help us to remind, remind us uh, that we can rest in you. Remind us, Father, that you are the, the vine dresser and that you will take care of us, Lord, in whatever capacity that means. Our only responsibility is to keep abiding, to keep growing, and to make more room in our lives to be a blessing. We pray this in your name. Amen.